Professor Vladimir Lorman uh, was the original member of the organizing committee of the first uh, workshop on physical virology in 2012. He was also the member of the editorial board for the special issue on physical virology, which was uh, published as proceedings um, of that meeting. He was uh, also the member of the organizing committee for this meeting, uh, 2017. Actually, quite a few of the participants uh, of the speakers at the meeting were suggested by him. And uh, as he passed away uh, last year, we decided it would be appropriate to commemorate him and uh, his contribution. Uh, the way we uh, envision this section is that there will be one talk by Andrea Parmigiani, his colleague at the University of Montpellier, describing a little bit the um, uh, scientific endeavors of uh, Vladimir. And then uh, the other three talks are just standard talks of the uh, workshop, but in one way or the other connected with uh, Vladimir. This is the plan. So uh, I would ask you, uh, Andrea, to uh, tell us a little bit about Vladimir, then we will have a break and proceed with the other three talks. Thank you very much, Rudy, for this introduction. So um, it's my pleasure to be here today because I have the possibility to, to speak about Vladimir that was a friend, a colleague, and a teacher at the University of Montpellier. And somehow also, he, as you will see later, he's, uh, let's say, he was the head of the initiative to, to join physics and biology in Montpellier. And this for some historical fact that I will try to explain, and somehow also explain the, also the scientific evolution and the endeavor of, of Vladimir in, in science in general. So let me tell you first that uh, the family greets you, and uh, they appreciate a lot the fact that there was a session in his honor. We will try to organize also something in Montpellier in the next month. And uh, on the other side, I would like to say also that uh, when Rudy offered me this, proposed me this, uh, this initiative, I was very happy about that. But at the same time, to speak about the work of Vladimir was a, a little bit scary for me. Because I collaborate with Vladimir, but I recognize two things. One is the fact that he did very, very good physics. But on the other side, also the physics he proposed is unconventional, as unconventional are the system that he studied somehow. It's a very high level physics. And technically, uh, at least for people with my background, it was not always obvious to catch what he was trying to explain to me and was repeating, repeating, repeating many times. So I will try to make a panorama, to, pro pro to propose you a panorama that probably is, is very incomplete and also suffer of some superficial superficiality. And uh, I think that scientifically there are other scientists here, like Rudy and even more Sergei, that could explain to you any detail of the theory that they developed with Vladimir uh, up to now. Uh, recently, there are publications on that. 
And then, of course, in all these dynamics, I mean, we also collaborated, and I will show you also some, some very recent uh, work that somehow is a, is a very symbolically very important because somehow joined different theorists in the, in the same topics in Montpellier. So, I would like to start with some pictures that are quite symbolic, I would say, about uh, Vladimir activities and, and life and events. This was the uh, typical object that you could find in Vladimir uh, office. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the construction he made with some magnetic beads that he was used to explain a lot of physics of liquid crystals or uh, assemblies of proteins. But usually, the door of Vladimir was open, and you could enter and start to discuss. He was taking his tea quite regularly every afternoon, right? And then he had this shape that he was helping to think about his research, but they were also actually used in, during courses because he was an, an, ex, an excellent teacher. So um, in this, you find elements of what was the physics that Vladimir was, was uh, developing. And I will try to, to, to enrich this feature and to show that despite the fact that he, he studied many different si systems, somehow there was really a, a common denominator in all these studies. And this denominator was uh, the use, intense use of symmetries, the study of phase transitions, and the relation that phase transition have, for example, with the geometry. And so these touch fields of uh, uh, mathematics of dynamical systems and the work on catastrophe uh, theory and so on and so forth. Another picture that for me is uh, very emblematic of the work of Vladimir are this, this uh, uh, picture that he obtained, he published quite recently. Uh, in collaboration with, with Rudy and with, with Sergei. And somehow they represent the accomplishment of the beauty of this concept of symmetry you have in physics. And this was massively used to study the uh, DNA nucleosome assemblies at the level of the chromatin fiber on one side and on the other side to study something that is very uh, close to, to your topics, which is the uh, viruses assembly and capsids. This is a very emblematic uh, picture for me because this represents the last discussion I had with Vladimir at the blackboard. It was actually a discussion in which you can find elements of uh, mechanics because we were uh, fighting uh, along with the problem in developmental biology. And on the other side, I, I, I was discussing with other people about uh, rotary flagella. So as usual in blackboard of theorists, you have such kind of mix, and maybe some inspiration comes from this kind of disorder. But uh, when Vladimir was writing something, it was, it, he knew where he was going. That was, he was not writing a lot, but when he was writing something, it was really essential. So he thought a lot before making any kind of computation and so on. This blackboard, by the way, to make you a little bit the history, is a blackboard in which three Nobel Prize wrote on it, and also a almost Nobel Prize was actually, is actually the owner of this blackboard. And the, this, this owner, which is André Nebeu, who is André Nebeu, played a very important role in the scientific development of uh, Vladimir's career and, and uh, also the interface between physics and biology in Montpellier. What to say about Vladimir from my personal point of view? Uh, these are my masters. Somehow the people that started from the PhD during Jacques Pro and Frank Schulischer, and then during my postdoc, Erwin Frey, and finally when I got an assistant professor position at, uh, in Montpellier uh, with Vladimir, I mean, these are the people that somehow 
draw me in science, and I recognize that, I mean, Vladimir in the last 15 years was really a source of inspiration, and beyond the simple fact of publishing, I mean, he, he gave me a different perspective of thinking about physics and the physics of biological systems. There are suggestions that I keep very secret about uh, the system I'm used to study, for example, problems in intracellular transport. And Vladimir gave me suggestion that I don't tell anybody, but I'm hoping to use in the next years. And this comes from fields that I would never imagine that could be put in relation with such topics. So, to describe in some, uh, to start to describe in some condensed way the Vladimir activity, to be honest, is, is an exercise which is a little bit difficult because he studied really a lot of things. And he had also a period of work, especially during the, the time in Russia, in which it's not so easy to find publication in English. So unfortunately, I don't speak Russian, and uh, I will let you know also what kind of situation I had to live, because Vladimir was Russian, and Sergei was Russian. I will give you a, a small uh, anecdotic fact a bit later. But what I did is was to recover more or less the ensemble of publication of Vladimir, and I took the title, and I tried to, to make a, a diagram of uh, word counting. And uh, as you can see, you can find uh, keywords that Vladimir and his collaborator choose the, in, uh, in the, in the, for the title of their work. So something that in, in the end is quite representative. And it's very interesting to find that at the center there is theory. And as a matter of fact, Vladimir was a, a very, very serious theorist and for the techniques he was managing and the, the way he was thinking was really a theorist. And I will explain to you in a few minutes also the context, the scientific context, context in which Vladimir started his activities in Montpellier. And the fact that he was a real theorist was very, very important. When I look at the publication plus the communication Vladimir did, there are other words that emerge from these clouds. And as you can see here, you have virus, virus, of course. But you have also terms like order. So a very peculiar point of Vladimir activity was the study of the phase transition. And especially all the uh, very uh, sophisticated mechanism to pass from a state of disorder toward the state of order, characterized by symmetries of high complexity. So it's not surprising that you can find this, this kind of board uh, when you put the, you consider also the communication in the ensemble of title of Vladimir uh, production, because I think that it was a very real concern for him to transmit this notion of transition from disorder to order state. Of course, you find other words that for you are very familiar, like cosahedral or mesophase, capsid, and so on and so forth. So now I would like to describe to you some scientific fact. It's a kind of short uh, uh, life uh, description of by dates of Vladimir, but then I will try to reinterpret all this in a, some partially in, by, by making also some personal consideration. So Vladimir uh, got his diploma in 1981 at the University of Rostov on the Don in Russia, and uh, in 1988 he took his uh, state doctorate. At the, universe, at the Theoretical Physics uh, Institute of Condensed Matter at the University of Rostov on Don and the AM Prokhorov General Physics Institute at the Academy of Science in Russia. Very few years 
later, 1990, and it's the year in which, you know, in, this, in the Soviet Union, there is a very serious um, political situation, Vladimir decides to fly to France. So in the end, it's not directly to Montpellier. Uh, in the map, I should point before Amiens and then Montpellier. But he flies to Amiens, and there he starts an activity as a normal postdoc, uh, while I think uh, his level was for sure the level of uh, researcher. But he had the opportunity to go to Amiens, and this was the first step of, uh, of his career in, in France. So if you want to see the, the date, after that, he got an assistant or lecturer position at the University of Picardy in Amiens. And then in 1999, get the position of associate professor and a few years later as a full professor at the University of Montpellier. This transition from uh, Russia, from Rostov to Amiens, and then from Amiens to, to Montpellier correspond to a change of topics in Vladimir's scientific evolution that I will try to describe to you uh, in a few minutes. In Montpellier, after that, he took, he didn't do only research, but he took a lot of uh, complex responsibilities at the teaching and administrative level, and uh, up to become deputy director of the laboratory of physics and organizing the interdisciplinary access and participating to initiative of excellence like the new MEV uh, LabEx. So he was really working a lot. And he was working a lot by taking care also of the community that, uh, let's say, started to develop just a few years later his arrival in Montpellier. And uh, the community is still growing up in these days. And we try to, to follow a little bit the, the, the perspective that Vladimir gave since, uh, since the beginning of the 2000s. So now let me provide you the description of Vladimir's activity and also some important point about his life, his scientific life. These are facts that have been told to me by Vladimir and partially I really experienced directly because I joined Montpellier in 2003, so a few years later. And also, uh, this is also complemented with some thought about, uh, about this uh, point. So, in 1997, he took the French habilitation to be a PhD supervisor. Why this is important? Because since a few years was at the University of Picardy, and uh, he started to work on liquid crystals intensively, and uh, is known by Jacques Pro, that at the time was uh, director at the, of a laboratory at SPCA in Paris. And Jacques Pro is also the president of the jury uh, of the disabilitation title that uh, somehow uh, allows the, the, the researcher to become independent because he can follow PhD student, he can build up a team, and so on and so forth. And this is a picture of the discussion between Vladimir and Jacques. And for me, this is a very important picture because Jacques at that time was my PhD advisor. And I didn't know anything about liquid crystal. I knew that there was a book that he wrote with the Gen, and that was a very important issue in science. But for me, it was quite a scaring object, liquid crystals. And of course, Vladimir was providing very important contribution at that time. So Jacques was a person that helped him in his career and is, is, uh, supported him a lot. So why this is important? Because in 1996, there is the first big initiative to develop the interface between physics and biology. And it's the date in which the laboratory of physical chimie Curie uh, was born. And uh, it was a unit in which we had biologists, physicists, chemists working all together in the same unit. And it was something quite uh, 
peculiar for the French system. Jacques Pro was uh, called as director from this PCI, and this was uh, under the suggestion of Francois Brochard and Pierre Gilles de Gênes, that push a lot to uh, help the people in the community of soft matter to get involved in biological physics issues. So last year we celebrated the 20 years of this lab, and you maybe know it as a very nice place, and uh, I mean they are doing very nice things. At that time I had the opportunity to be a PhD student there with Jack and Frank. So in 1997, Vladimir got the habilitation, and in 1998 he participated to a school, the physics at the scale of the, scale, at the, scale of the cell, that was organized by Bertrand Fourcade, de Jacques Pro, and also Armand Hdari. And this, this year is very important because I met Vladimir there for the first time. Somebody smiling at you, very open, and, uh, but also somebody that was, when he was explaining some physics, for me was kind of foreigner language because his way of thinking was very peculiar. And I will try to explain to you why, why this, why form uh, this way in, in, during the time. So these are years that are very important. Why? Because in 1998, Vladimir got the position of professor in Montpellier. Why? Well, the very important point is the fact that André Neveu has a wife in biology. But André Neveu is, as may, maybe you know, is a, is, a, is a great theoretical physicist that developed theory of superstrings. But he knew that biology was one of the new frontiers for physics. So he wanted to build up a very strong uh, activity in biological physics. And in the meanwhile, he was also building a very strong community in mathematical physics in Montpellier. I would say in the 90s, he, rec he, could, he, could, he was, was able to recruit Alexei Zardomologikov, uh, Vladimir Fateyev, and this is, these are kind of divinities in the field of, uh, in the context of field theory and integrable systems. Um, Mikhail Diakonov, that was a theorist of the condensed matter and the electronic systems, that he did the different discoveries. And the first person that was recruited in this field of really pure theoreticians from the R Russian school, by the way, was Vladimir. And Vladimir was appointed of developing, because of his experience in soft matter, in developing the interface between physics and biology. And all the history in Montpellier start at that time. So I think that in this time, Vladimir developed the feeling that biological physics was really a direction he had to develop his research. And uh, I will focus in the following mostly on this point, although I will try also to give you a perspective from the previous year. So I described to you the scientific pathways from the 80s up to now, and I try to divide them in these uh, uh, sub-chapters. So in the 80s, uh, Vladimir is, is working on general aspects of the theory of phase transition and crystallization to study condensed matter of metals, alloys, magnetism, but he's also doing something very specific, which is the interpretation of the phase transition diagram via geometrical description and the use of symmetries in a way that it was much more natural, inspired, let's say, from the theory of the geometrical theory of dynamical systems. He entered in contact with Vladimir Arnold. And the, the interesting point is that if you get this issue from the IOP website, you find afterward that the IOP suggests also to watch this paper in which Vladimir is co-author. So for me this is, when I found this recently, I was uh, quite, uh, not say excited, but uh, 
It explained to me some kind of draw that Vladimir gave, did on the blackboard and on the paper, because he was really trying to apply very advanced methods from mathematics to understand the physics of the phase transition by the use of, of these diagrams. And even at the teaching level, we were exchanging about this point. So this is a point uh, which is very important because then, more specifically, Vladimir was working on the Landau theory of phase transition at that time. And this is something, as I told you, that he represent a kind of backbone of all his research. So after that, when he moved to, uh, to Amiens, he started to work intensively in liquid crystals and quasi-crystals, and of course, he was working on the theory of structure of liquid crystal and phase transition, and here you have some publications on this topic. Um, he did also a lot of work at that time. In the, this reminds me, when I was in some difficult period of my career, he was telling me, remember, that there, is, uh, there are periods in which you have to produce a very strong effort. It's only you that can do it. And it was explained to me what was his experience when he left Russia to move to France and then to get adapted to a new world and uh, to work on different topics. And in doing this, he, he did a lot of work also with experimentalists. So he was a pure theorist, but he was also very open to discuss with experimentalists. And this is key also for the rest of his career. After that, when he moved to Montpellier, well, there was this approach to very fundamental systems in biology. And uh, here you have, uh, the, let's say, the chapter of the study of DNA crystalline phases and the nucleosomes, so the, these assemblies of uh, DNA and uh, nucleosomic particle in the genome that regulate actually the, stru actually the structure of the genome, genome. And here you can see some re relevant contribution and uh, inspired also by experimental facts like uh, uh, cryo-electron microscopy produced by, on nucleosomic particle produced by Francois Livolan. And as you can see here, Rudy was uh, very strongly involved in, in this kind of topics. And from this work, this were produced this phase of the chromatin fiber I, I showed you before. So here there is a, a very interesting attempt by, by Vladimir and his collaborator to try to describe this kind of assemblies in terms of soft matter systems and no more as a kind of macroscopic solid complexes. At that time, there was a lot of modeling at the molecular level, but Vladimir was convinced that the, these phases were also the, the product, actually, of very low energy mode and the fluctuation of the system, and somehow should be, uh, this kind of uh, phases should be related to the intrinsic properties of symmetries of this uh, molecular object. A very important chapter that concerned this conference was developed a few years after. And here you, you find uh, that, uh, I mean, this fundamental contribution in, in physical virology about uh, this uh, new way to describe viral capsid and uh, generalizing the theory of Kaspar and Krug. This was a work that developed mostly with uh, Sergei Rochal, that uh, is a historical collaborator of Vladimir. And uh, what to say? I think later there will be, there will be talks on this subject. Uh, I think that this is a very, very beautiful illustration of how was Vladimir thinking about these systems. And the, of course, the physics behind that is, is, is still, is always highly non-trivial. Then, in parallel, Vladimir was also trying to break some paradigm in other fields. So the first example I provide to you is the theory of structural, structured membranes and protein membrane interactions. I think this is a very important paper. 
because somehow Vladimir, when he wants to, to describe uh, the uh, viscoelastic fluctuation of a, of a vesicle decorated with the cytoskeleton, so uh, something which is not only a lipid membrane, but it's uh, something that looks much more like a real cell. He tried to describe this not with the standard language of people describing lipid membranes with the theory of Kahnem Elfrich, but he used something which is very specific of the Russian school of mechanics, meaning the mechanics of thin, solid shells. And uh, of course, there were also other scientists that were developing this that at the time, but by doing that, uh, he, he, he showed very interesting features, and somehow, in, also in this example, but uh, I mean also in, uh, in uh, this paper, uh, yeah, viscoelastic dynamics of, uh, oh, no, sorry, this one, cytoskeletal influence on normal and tangent fluctuation mode in the red blood cells, he was able to explain contradiction, contradictionary uh, experimental facts. Somehow he was able to show that the physics of a membrane together with the cytoskeleton, cortical cytoskeleton, is much more similar to the physics of a solid system than is just a lipid membrane which is always considered something as liquid ensemble of lipid molecules. So I will focus on this example because this is a very nice example in which also biology got a very important contribution from, from theoretical physics. This is a red blood cell that is uh, invaded by parasite of malaria. And here is described the sequence of the of degress of this parasite from the red blood cell. This was an experiment performed in my biology lab, uh, and, and uh, they could use a, a high-speed camera to understand what was the mechanism. And this mechanism is composed by three phases. The first, the formation of a pore by the parasite, and then the parasite can escape from the red blood cells by using two mechanical instabilities. The first is a curling instability that was described theoretically by Vladimir and Andrew Kala Jones at that time. And then in the final part, the parasites that are in large number inside the red blood cells, they somehow ejected in the viscous medium of the blood by a buckling instability, like a solid object. This mechanical effect is fundamental for the parasite. Why? Because the parasite can survive very short time in the blood, the plasma. It needs to attach to another red blood cells and then invade it again. And this is the mechanism by which malaria is very dangerous, right? So it was very interesting to discover that the physics, the mechanics of red blood cells, and it's still a very, it's an ongoing topic in, in Montpellier, but the mechanics of the red blood cells is fundamental for such kind of biological pro process. And of course, this all has also in implication in, from the point of view of therapies, because if you can work on such kind of mechanism, you can make red blood cells different with different uh, chemical composition, then you can, you can expect also to uh, reduce the effect of the spreading of this parasite inside the blood. The other example, and this is also a conventional system in which uh, the theory of Vladimir and Sergei was very important also from the biological point of view, is an example of the study of the apoptosis, life and apoptosis in non-proliferative epithelia. So this is a topic that concerns a creature that I'm going to show you in this slide, is Sion intestinalis. 
It's essentially a digestive tube that lives in the water, but it's a very important model system for biologists. Because, first of all, from the evolutionary point of view, is a system that is between the vertebrate and invertebrate in, in the development of organism. It's a system for which we know exactly the genome, and of course, all developmental biologists, they, they work on it. They are quite curious system because from, they have a descendant uh, development because in the, from the egg, which is represented by this ensemble of uh, cells, there is a tadpole that escapes, but this tadpole does not develop as a normal organism, but yeah, it, it has a kind of regression and it becomes just a digestive tube that then fix on, the, on, the, on some rocks or the bottom of the sea. So here you have a picture of this egg, and then this, uh, you have a very quite elaborate tissue. You have uh, follicular cells. You have uh, cells that uh, has a nucleus here. There is another cell here that is at the base. And then you have an epithelial tissue inside in which essentially for each cell at the surface, you have 20 cells just below. And these cells that can communicate, that can exchange material. As you can see here, the symmetry is very similar to the object that Vladimir started to work on the same time, which are viruses and icosahedral viruses. And so it was very interesting, the, the fact that they, him and, and Sergei, they could elaborate knowledge from this system, starting from what they did on solid viral capside, capsids, and here, of course, the physics is, is different because cells here are soft objects. But, of course, by using property of symmetries and counting, counting seriously the position of the nuclei of these cells and studying the intersection, they could understand, also by using statistical methods, they could understand that the organization of these cells was not kind of casual one. It was reproduced systematically in each egg. And this organization was peculiar for the life of the organism. Why? Because actually the cells here at the base of this follicle, they send an apoptotic message, they die, and they send an apoptotic message to kill all the cells below. By this apoptosis, the eggs open and the tadpole can get out. If this sequence of messages cannot occur, the organisms cannot live. So this was interesting because they provide a, an important contribution because they could verify that by, by, by studying the system, they could verify that the signal was controlled by this cell here at the base of the follicle to, to control the development of, of this of this tissue, and from that, there was the development of a theory of apoptotic controllers, which is, of course, very important from the biological point of view, because people are thinking about the possibility that, for example, not only in developmental biology, but also in cancer, there could be cells that play a very key role in controlling the destiny and the fate of the surrounding cells. If you can control these cells, you can also have a way to control the development of the cancer. So this contribution, as you see, they obliged to do some physical work, some physics work, sorry, to discuss a lot with biologists. But they are relevant contribution, not only from the physical point of view, but also from the biological one. Let me finish about a recent work that we developed in Montpellier. And here all the expertise about protein assemblies in uh, genome by Vladimir was very fundamental. And we are missing him a lot about this. But nevertheless, we, we can accomplish interesting results. This is a completely different problem. 
We want to understand how the genome of a bacteria is divided and what is the mechanism, which is a non-equilibrium mechanism, allow the bacterium to segregate the two copies of the genome and not only segregate, but also to position at the right place these genomes inside the bacterium. So here you have an illustration of, of this event. Of course, this is very important also for application because if you manage to, ah, you don't see it. See, oh, sorry, maybe I have to. Yeah. So you, it's very important because people are thinking also to control uh, bacterial division by by developing new kind of uh, antibiotics. So you can see this, this event that is reproduced very systematically and uh, with Vladimir we could develop a model that reproduce well these kind of features. So I'm concluding and uh, I hope that I gave you some perspective of what was, what has been the work by Vladimir, and then you can understand how he could develop ideas that brought us to these beautiful pictures, but particularly to these beautiful ideas on which we have to work on along with the, the time in the, in the future. But I would like to end this, uh, this presentation by making also a very important point about Vladimir's attitude towards science. Because Vladimir was not only a good teacher to physicists, but was uh, also somebody that was extremely open to discuss about all science and all cultural issues. He was a fan of geography and history. And uh, so I think that the, the best way to define Vladimir was, is that he was a humanist in the sense of the Renaissance, Italian Renaissance, if you let me say this. So I leave you with a the, with the sentence that was uh, sent to, to us by a colleague from the engineering and robotics department that shared with Vladimir a council in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the department of uh, art science, let's say. And uh, David Giro wrote to us and saying, a friend who taught us to love the beauty of physics and nature by the kindness of his personality, but also by the firmness in the science he knew perfectly. I think this resumes very well, Vladimir. So thank you very much. <laughs>